Okay, aloha everyone, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, uh, return guest, Peter Sternlich of Sustainable Energy Hawaii. And today we're going to be talking story about our global energy reality and its implications for humanity. So, Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So just to get us calibrated and get, get going on this, um, how important is energy? I mean, we all it's, know what energy is, I think. But what is the relationship between energy and our economy and our way, way of life and how we live? Well, I mean, there's, you know, there are those that say energy is everything or everything is energy. But uh, within the context of uh, our economy, um, energy really is the master resource. So what you see here is a, is a chart that graphs GDP and energy consumption against each other. And, and just so people just tell them what GDP is. Uh, that's uh, a, a gross domestic product. Okay. The pressure it was on. It kind of measures how well our economy is doing. Yeah, it, it, the pressure was on. Yeah, right. <laughs> it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what the historical data in this chart shows us is is a is that there's a direct co correlation between the two, and that the deviation between energy consumption and global GDP over 50 years has been less than one percent. So at the bottom, excuse me, uh, at the bottom, um, we have a quote from Robert Ayers, um, where essentially he describes or explains that everything that takes place in every economy requires energy. And so what we do is we actually transform that energy into products and services. So that, that I mean, if, yeah. if you, if without you, energy, uh, we don't do anything. Yeah, somebody once told me if you go and sit on a park bench or if you're waiting for your bus and you look at everything around you and say, gee, how much energy is in that? There's everything in the roads and the, and the steel for the seat you're sitting on, the buildings, everything took energy. The clothes you're wearing, you know, it's it's there. So we're hearing a lot about climate change these days. Every time we have a new storm or a new uh, disaster, we uh, talk about climate change. And there seems to be a desire to reduce and eventually eliminate the use of fossil fuels. What are your thoughts on how this is influencing policy? We are at the policy forum here. Yeah. Um, well, today we're we're definitely deeply involved with uh, with climate change and. Um, you know, but I think the reality is is that that what we're doing is we're going we're we're involved in a, in an energy transition. Um, it, it's just we're we're changing how we power our economy. What we're trying to do is is literally is to electrify the global economy. We're we're going from fossil fuels to electricity, and the way we are explaining or justifying doing that to ourselves is that we're trying to decarbonize everything. So anyhow, I think I think it is fair to say that decarbonization is the primary goal around which global energy policy is being conducted. We want to decarbonize our energy consumption. But if we look at the big picture of energy, as I look at that big picture of energy consumption, I find myself asking some questions like, is decarbonization really the best metric for setting policy? Um, I mean, carbon is an issue, and I'm not suggesting it isn't, but it's, is it the only issue surrounding energy that really, that needs our attention today? So one of the questions to begin with is, are we being effective at this strategy? Are we reducing the amount of fossil fuels we're using? And are we reducing um, the amount of carbon we're emitting into the, into the atmosphere? So, you know, given today's economy and the population that we have on the planet, do we actually think we can eliminate fossil fuels from our energy mix at any point in the future um, and keep the, the system, the economy, the type of the, the way that we live going consistently? Well, let's, uh, let's look at some data now and uh, to show uh, the impact, you know, the, uh, the percentages of fossil fuels versus the upcoming renewables. Sure. So yeah. what you have... Yeah, what you have here is a, is a graph that tallies um, global energy consumption um, since 1800. 
and it runs through 2022, which is the last year that we have a, a complete annual set of data. And it includes both fossil fuels and renewables. Um, it's and it and what we've done here, or what the people who created this this chart have done, is they've con converted everything into a common metric, which is electricity terawatt hours. And so from there, we can compare oil to solar panels or wind turbines or hydroelectric plants. So if you look at the graph, you can see that the, that the three sources with the highest energy output are oil, coal, and natural gas. And toward the bottom are the, all the renewables that are uh, electrical power, hydro, you know, hydro, biomass, nuclear, wind, solar, et cetera. And if we look at the uh, the vertical um, index there, we see that oil alone provides 50,000 terawatts of, of power in the year 22, if you look at the far, far right-hand side. Coal is right behind it at about 45, and natural gas is at 40. All the renewables sit at about 12,000 or less. That's, uh, that's pretty low. So just to- We're getting there. <laughs> Take it to uh, the last twenty years. Let's let's uh, drill down further and uh, pull up the next slide. There you go, and we've got Excellent. some nice little red circles there. So why don't you yeah. explain what we're seeing there, Peter? So this is the same chart, but it's stretched out horizontally to um, to only cover the year, uh, cover the range of uh, the year two thousand to twenty twenty two, and. I think this is a, the time frame we really want to look at because that's where the majority of our decarbonization efforts have taken place. And we see that you know, we see that hydro traditional biomass nuclear have maintained relatively con a relatively constant uh, level or contribution to the ener energy mix, but that wind, solar, and renewables are really just coming into play. This is not looking very good, Peter. So, well, I mean, you have, I mean. Realistically, you've got to start somewhere, but I think the point of this is, is that we're trying to, that, that we're looking at what is driving our strategy and what what's driving our strategy is the, the idea of decarbonizing our atmosphere because of climate change. And so the question is, are we actually doing that? We can actually take some of the, some of the data that was pulled off these charts and and drill down into it. So what we have here is on the left, we have a chart that represents the energy consumption during the year 2000. And on the right, we have the year 2022. We can also see that the, uh, what, what we've done is broken the data into subcategories of fossil fuels and no or low carbon fuels. So that nuclear and biomass, ha oh, I was gonna say, yeah, nuclear and biomass aren't really renewables. Um, but for the ease of discussion, I'm just going to, as we go on, I'm going to refer to them as, as renewables, even though I've, you know, they're, they're labeled as, as, uh, no and low carbon. Right. So in the year 2000, we consumed, um, about 94,000 terawatts of fossil fuels and about 28,000 terawatts of renewables. And that mix calculates out to be about 77% of the energy mix was fossil fuels and 23% right. renewables. So if we look at 2022. Which is 20 years. 22 years. Yeah, or 23 years, actually. yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually 23. But um, so, you know, if we look at that, if we look at 2022, we see that we consumed 137,000 terawatts of fossil fuels, which is an increase of 45% in that period of time. So we're consuming- yeah, we're, four, I thought we were supposed to be going down. Yeah, we were, but we went up 45% in, right. you know, since 2000. And with renewables, it grew also about the same amount, 46%. Right. And so between the two, uh, between the two overall, you know, the increase in energy was 46%. You can see that at the very bottom of this slide. And uh, what really shocked me was to look at the relationship between renewables and fossil fuels over that, you know, the 2000 to 2022 timeframe, and it didn't change at all. It's exactly the same. It's, it's amazing. 
So not only are are we consuming more fossil fuels, we're logically emitting more carbon and greenhouse gases. So this focus on decarbonization, you know, goes back to the question I asked a little earlier. Why do we believe that this is something we can achieve? And is is carbon and this is I mean, this is something that, you know, I'm not I'm not meaning to suggest that this is that pursuing these other, you know, that renewables is a waste of time. But the way we describe what we're doing and what's motivating us and the goal we're seeking may not be properly assessed. It may be, but it may not be. I'm looking at the historical data and I'm going, where's the progress? So what's the connection between fossil fuels and renewable energy? Are, are renewables truly fossil free? I guess is how I, you it, define it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that I, as far as the general public goes, as far as, you know, just our community and, you know, how we look at this, we, we think about renewable energy and we think about solar panels and we think about wind turbines and batteries and all the stuff that we're using to, you know, to, to transition away from, um, you know, direct use of fossil fuels. But there's a there's a difference between a renewable energy source. Sunlight is a renewable energy source. The heat under our feet, you know, with geothermal is a renewable energy source. Right. But the systems that we use to transform that energy into something that can do work for us requires fossil fuels. There's nothing else there. We have, I mean, to do the mining of raw materials, the processing, the manufacturing, the assembly of the systems, and the and the distribution, the global distribution of everything that we produce in the world in a global economy. Right. That is exclusively done with fossil fuels, and in particular, liquid fossil fuels. Petroleum is what right. powers all this stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you got to get all this stuff from the mine to the to the factory and like you said it takes ships and trucks and everything else like that and they all run it right now they all run on fossil fuels yep yeah so I, I i think it's important that that as a as a society as a culture we have a proper picture of what it is that we're attempting to do and also what we're actually doing and succeeding at because if we focus on carbon and we have uh, other situations, which we'll get to into a little bit later in this presentation. You know, are we are we really are, are we picking our battles? Are we verbalizing it in the proper context so that we approach it with the right expectations? Because people don't like to be disappointed. All of these systems start with mining, and right. it's not something that we think about. But everything is 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 made from stuff we dig up out of the ground whether and that includes oil and coal and you know all of the all yeah. of the metals and and minerals that we use to manufacture all this stuff the silicon you know the polysilicon that goes into our solar panels that comes out of the ground so um you know i think i i think t it, having an understanding that that's that that's what's happening i think is is important Again, so it sets our expectations in a proper way. So where do we get all this stuff that we dig out of the ground? This is a um, uh, this is an illustration of the mining productivity around the world and the size of the circles is is relative to the volume of minerals that are you know that are specified by the little colored. Yeah pie slices around there and i think it's it's pretty clear that the largest contributor to um to mining raw materials and here's crm and srm are critical raw materials and strategic raw materials so these are all things that um as the name suggests are cr critical and strategic to um our national security and also the way we want to live. Right. So if if we go to the next slide, 
Uh, uh, before you do that, before you yeah. do that, I just want everybody to focus on the China pie. Look how look how big that is compared to everybody else. That's our good friend. It's our good friend. No geopolitics there at all. Yeah. So okay, now we can move on to the next. And and this next slide is also kind of overwhelming. Yeah, because it's it's also it has to do with where all of these things are processed. When you dig materials out of the ground comes out is you know like it's all mixed up with you know with dirt and rocks and all this other yeah. stuff and so it's got to be filtered and processed and and purified so that we can make stuff out of it um and as as that slide illustrates the vast majority of processing and in particular w for uh critical raw materials um China again is 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 the number one is dominant is is absolutely dominant. So and I think that oh sorry go ahead Peter. Yeah, that that's I mean I I think that that paints the picture is is that there is in addition to a supply chain issue one of the things that affects a supply chain is geopolitics and. And it's also going to be economics. So if for any reason, you know, the supplies are curtailed in any way at all, who's going to get them? Who makes that decision? Right. How much does it cost? These all these all have have implications in our in our desire to decarbonize. So uh, let's uh, a, a prime example of that is the solar industry. So if we go to the next slide, it's really staggering. We're really relying on, you know, just. Solar panels, solar panels, solar panels. I mean, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that I suppose I could have pointed out in that in that uh, in that chart that showed the comparison between two thousand and twenty twenty two was that the deployment of 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 solar globally in that period of time was a hundred and ten thousand percent increase. So that's an eleven hundred times what we were yeah. doing in two thousand is what we were doing in. 1100 times that much that's a in lot 2022 <laughs> is a lot and it made zero difference right in in the in the mix and we still increased how much how much fossil fuel so yeah i mean so anyhow yeah if we go to if we go back to this you know to the uh the slide with the map about the polysilicon yeah so that is yeah that one um so China is again dominant. Um, they control seventy-five percent of the global polysilicon supply from which panels are made, and they manufacture eighty percent of the finished panels. Right. So, you know, again, it's like uh, you know, we look ahead twenty years, and they're selling economic oxygen. Right. And we're dependent on that. How do we become, you know, looking at the solution, which is something that probably will take a whole program in and of itself. The world needs to become locally self-reliant, self-sufficient. And right. that, yeah, that's, that's a whole nother subject. So anyhow, they, you know, it, we're, we're, we're fabricating or we're creating you know, quite a quite a level of dependency. Um, in addition to the carbon we're putting into the atmosphere. So have us have a look at some of the uh, these critical materials. So let's pull up uh, the next slide, slide twelve, and I, I think we'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because this is a very important. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, gonna description uh, of I'm, what we need. All right, I'm 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 pulling this up on a different screen so that I can see it. So, um. So a colleague of mine um, who works with uh, the Geological Survey of Finland, Simon Michel, has um, has done some pretty groundbreaking work and done some. Right. He's done an analysis of okay, if we want to replace fossil fuels, what's it going to take? Yeah. Right. So he's looked at the 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 constituent you know uh, portions of copper, nickel, lithium, cobalt, graphite, vanadium. That will go into not only the generation systems, but also the storage systems, 
that we have to use because all of these things, wind and solar are intermittent. They don't, they, they're all, you know, they're, they're, they're affected by weather and of course, whether the sun is shining or not. Right. So in the leftmost column of numbers, he's calculated the amount of metals that would be um, required to produce just one generation of what he's referring to as technology units to phase out fossil fuels. So with copper, he's he's come up with this number of 4,730,000,000 metric tons. But in the middle column, what we see is that what all the geological surveys around the world estimate as being the total reserve on planet Earth is only 18% of that. So the that's, that's so our, scary. So our ability to build this from those mined materials may not exist at the level we're targeting. Right. And is that part of part of the discussion that we're we're having when we formulate policy that is the economy? Energy and the economy are one and the same. So when we make policy involving energy, we're making economic policy. And economic policy affects how all of us interact with the grocery store. Well, also, you know, if we say we're going to electrify every car, every car is going to be a battery electric vehicle, and then you've got to re reconductor your grid, you're going to have to add a lot more copper to that grid in addition to the copper that goes in all these electric vehicles. Well, so you know that's uh, that's pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and I, we we need to move on because I, I I know we're we're running short on time. But the in the history of mankind, we've mined seven hundred million tons of right. copper, and that goes back six thousand years. We still need to come up with another eight hundred and eighty thousand <laughs> tons. But and we yeah. need to do it by twenty fifty, right? Or twenty forty five. That's what twenty years. So, uh, but I also want to look at the, uh, the where you've got uh, circled. Uh, so let's talk about actual mines. Yeah. So what? It, what it, I mean, that's really that's really so, stunning. Yeah. So my my colleague uh, Simon, his PhD is in mining, and he spent decades in the mining industry, and so this is an important thing because you know people. Well, let's just go look for more. Economists go, well, we'll just go get more. We'll find more as if it's infinitely yeah. replaceable. I mean, that's traditional economics. So a stat that he's come up with is that for every thousand deposits you discover, only one or two become mines. And the ones that do become mines take 20 years to develop. And then out of 10, out of the 10, so that, so if you get 10 out of what, 500 or 1,000 discover or uh, 5,000 deposits that you discover, you know, 20 to 30 percent go bankrupt right so this is not as it, it's not as easy as just let's go dig up more it's 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 more complicated than that right well let's have a look at the oil situation we're coming down to the finish right. line here well yeah um so with with petroleum which is really used for industrial transportation um, that is a finite resource. And there's been a lot of discussion for many years about um, the fact that the amount that we use, which is now about 100 million barrels a day. Okay, so we're using 37 yeah. billion barrels a year. Wow. Right, so we're using over, you know, so in 30 years, so anyhow, it's a trillion barrels. And they're just, we're using it at an incredible rate. So that's that's the flow rate of petroleum. So this company, which is one of the most respected, highly regarded energy analytical companies in the world, Rice Dead Energy, in, in 2021 and 2022, determined that the recoverable reserves, and when we say recoverable, that means economically and technically recoverable. I mean, yeah. if it if it costs five hundred dollars a barrel to recover oil, you're looking at a global recession or a depression. So you can't the the economics are really important. So what they're forecasting is that 
And this is what's in the red, is that the global production of oil and natural gas liquids is going to contract by 50% by 2050. So that's in 26 years. Right. Okay. That we'll have half of what we have today. And that's the stuff that moves the global economy. It's, it is what right. moves things from China to the yeah. United States, to right. India, to, and everywhere around the world. So this is something that we need to consider, too. What does this ultimately mean? Are, are we, we, I, I come to the conclusion that we're looking at, it, at, a, at an irreversible contraction in the, in the economy because there's just simply going to be less energy for many so reasons. We're, gonna, we're running change. out of time. We're running out of time, so we can't be continuing to use fossil fuels. So we may, we may be forced into stopping in, in cutting back on fossil fuels because right. of the supply issue. So but, we need all those scientists to come up there and find some unobtainium to fuel right. our economy. But it could be a number of other things. But we're running out of time too. Yeah. So I want so, to go quickly to the last slide, which is gives an right. idea. Uh, just uh, quickly, Peter, just show how. Yeah, long it's... very, very quickly. I mean, you look at the lower left or the lower right hand corner, and essentially what this is, is a graph of is the transition time for traditional biomass, which is that large gray portion, and the darker gray is coal. And then you have the rise of oil, and you have a, a timeline running along the lower lower portion. But basically, the purpose of this slide is to go energy transitions take a long time. And the transitions that we're looking at here took place when the global population was a billion, billion and a half people. We're over eight now. So yeah. making that transition is, um, is it a reasonable expectation? Is it a reasonable goal that we can tell ourselves after we got this covered? Right. I, that's just, I'm, so these are, these are questions I want to ask. And I think they are very relevant when it comes to to, you know, to formulating our public policy. Absolutely. So anyway, we've run, we've run out of time on the show. And this <laughs> is really a fascinating uh, set of uh, information that you gave us, Peter. Okay. So thank you so much. And I, I know you worked like all week putting this together. So it's, it was really nice, uh, really good of you to do it. And I think we have enough material to maybe come back and have a round two when we can kind of zero in on one or two specific areas. But yeah, I, what I we close what out. we do oh. is important. You know, we got to yeah. figure out what to do. What do we do now? Exactly. What's next? <laughs> so, um, I, um, we'll have to leave it there. As I said, we're running. We've run out of time. So, we've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy, on Think Tech Hawaii, and we've been talking history about our glo a story about our global energy reality. We've been looking at reality on this show and its implications for humanity. And I wish we had lots of good solutions with Peter Sternlich, who has shared his insights on this important topic. So thank you so much, Peter. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. We'll and it thanks again. to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy.